Ask your neighbor if I'm any good or not. I'm sure they'll be honest. Um, I'm told I do okay. Um, so, yeah, the title of today's sermon is called The God of Miracles. And this is a topic that, for me, has become quite near and dear uh, within the last uh, few weeks. On uh, April 10th, just a couple weeks ago, bear with me, um, I got a phone call from the rehab facility that my father was in saying that his defibrillator started shocking him that morning, and after six shocks, he was no longer awake, or as far as they were concerned, alive. They started CPR and called an ambulance. After 10 minutes of CPR, as well as two more external shocks, he came back. Now, I'm a nurse practitioner. I am intimately aware of what CPR does. I'm intimately aware of what a defibrillator does. And I know the severity of situations such as my father's. So I, I got that phone call halfway to work. I was almost to the, to the hospital. So after multiple phone calls to other family members that needed to know they needed to pack up and head south. My dad lives in Kentucky, so we had to get going. Arranging the 600 different things that my wife and I had to arrange in order to get our lives squared away enough so that we could go as well, we headed to Kentucky. And when we got there, my dad was in the ICU. Um, he was awake. He was alert. He was sore. Um, I spent a lot of time talking, I'll be nice here, talking older folks out of being full resuscitation, which is medical speak for getting everything done, CPR, meds, intubation, all that stuff, because of the severity of what is done to you. They can break ribs, they can puncture lungs, there's all kinds of things that can happen during CPR that, even if they get you back, can then turn around and kill you. And my dad was sore. And the x-ray wasn't really definitive. It was just a front one, so we couldn't tell if he broke any ribs or not. But he was awake and he was alive. And that was the best that I could hope for at that time. The first 48 hours after resuscitation is the most critical time after resuscitation, chances are extremely high that whatever puts you into that situation in the first place will reoccur. And so we spent four, five, Wednesday night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, yeah, five extremely stressful days waiting for the next step. My father's physician who was an electrophysiologist. That's the guy that deals with these things. My father was in a, an arrhythmia. That's what caused him to pass out and just about pass away. Told us that Monday morning between eight and noon, somewhere in there, he was going to do an ablation. Now, some of you in here probably have had one of those, most likely for atrial fibrillation and not VTAC or ventricular tachycardia. AFib's not too bad. Some of you might disagree with me, but from a medical standpoint, we can manage that. VTAC is very bad. VTAC, you don't live if it doesn't get fixed. My dad is not in the best of health, and I, this, this scenario was just completely in my wheelhouse because on the side, when I'm not working at Marlott Regional Hospital, I work for an electrophysiologist in Port Huron. So... Now I'm just in another situation where I know all the potential complications, I know all the possible outcomes, I know everything that could possibly go on, and let's just put it this way, I didn't get a lot of sleep. 
Again, my dad's not in the best of health. VTAC ablation is very different than AFib ablation because it can be coming from anywhere, inside or outside of the heart. Sometimes they have to actually create a cannula into your chest to ablate the outside of your heart, which is a very bad situation. You don't want to have to have that because the, the complication potential is just extremely high. Risk of stroke, risk of heart failure. My dad has heart failure to begin with. They have to use a lot of fluid during the procedure. So all these things are weighing on our minds while we're sitting there waiting. And each evening, I'm getting texts at 2, 3, 4 a.m. He's back in VTAC. They're giving him another med. They're adjusting this. They're adjusting that. And so the whole time, you're just wondering, is this it? But you know, it's, it's funny. In the time that you can be in a situation like that, and many of you here can very likely relate, when you're in the hospital and your loved one's in the ICU and you're just sitting there because there's nothing that you can do, the only thing you have left is to pray, right? And when you start to pray, all of a sudden, and this is at least what I found during my situation, is God started opening my eyes to some things. For the first time in two years, my entire immediate family was in one place. I have, um, I have two half-sisters. One of them we just found out about about two and a half, three years ago. I have a blood brother and a blood sister. And they're all blood, but directly related to me. And we were all in one place. And we were all communicating with each other. My, m- most of my family are believers, but I do have members of my family that aren't necessarily believers, or at least practice. And so the, the interactions can be interesting. The conversations can be very interesting. But I just started kind of seeing that, you know, there was something going on here, right? And it made me think that, you know, when, when God is moving, even if it doesn't look like he's moving, he's moving. And while I'm sitting in an ICU waiting room, just waiting for the phone call, either way, I started to see God do some things. And it made me think of how God does miracles. And how it's like, man, God, you know, you probably could have figured something else out other than my dad being in an ICU to get us all around each other. I would have preferred that. But it made me think about how God is very multifaceted, right? In many aspects, we look for miracles, right? This is a church that believes in miracles. We believe in the power of God. We believe that God can do anything. And many of you in here have been touched by that power. Many of you in here have seen God do amazing things. You've had healing. Some of you have had prodigals come home. Some of you have had financial blessings that were unexpected. You've, you've seen some of the miracles that God can do. And it made me think that, you know, even in the, even in the prayer for the miracle, God was starting to work some miracles, right? So I'm going to leave you all hanging, and we're going to come back to my dad's story in a minute. But when Brad reached out to me yesterday and was like, hey, man, I need someone to do a sermon for me because we're going to the hospital and things are happening, I knew exactly what I was going to talk about. I was going to talk about miracles because it's just, I think, something that sometimes we can get really hyper-focused on in 
sometimes the right ways and sometimes the wrong ways, and sometimes I don't think we focus on it enough, right? And the first question that I thought to, to myself when I was thinking about this sermon today was, so if miracles are still real, where are they? You read all through the New Testament with Christ. Even in the Old Testament, there was miracles, right? Some crazy stuff. I mean, Elijah slapped a river and it spread apart so he could walk on dry land with his cloak, you know. Moses parted the Red Sea. Fire came down from heaven and devoured a, an altar and, you know, a whole bunch of priests. <laughs> you know, there's this... You know, there's the Old Testament, the New Testament. There's, you know, Jesus' ministry, the disciples' ministry in Acts. After that, all the things that we see, it's like, man, you know, and then we have the mark. Go and do these things. Heal the sick, raise the dead. We have Jesus saying, you'll do greater than these. So it's like, okay, God, well, if miracles are still real, where are they? Why don't we see more? Now, granted... I think we've seen our fair share here at Elmont Vineyard Church. God moves here. But why don't we see more? Why is it that we pray over people and pray over people and pray over people and pray over people and nothing happens? Why is it that sometimes people are born a certain way? And we ask God, like, why? Why, why are there micro deletions, genetic abnormalities. Why are, are people born blind, deaf? Why do some people get sick and they're just sick? And we've laid hands and we've done the things and we've prayed the prayers and we've anointed them with oil and the elders have come around. We've done all the things that the Bible says that we're supposed to do, but yet we're still waiting. So yeah, I tackled that. And I I think this is going to be a hard word, but I also think it's going to be a word that's going to bring hope. And so I hope you all can follow with me and come with me on this little journey here that I took. And let's let's get some answers. Let's let's find out together why. We're, We're going to answer that question today, why? Why doesn't it always work? Right? In 1 John 5, verses 14 through 15, it says this This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. There's a very key part in this verse. I don't know if you noticed, it was underlined and italicized. According to his will. When we ask in his will, it's a guarantee. That's what that verse is saying. When you're doing the will of God and you're in his will, whatever you ask for, we're supposed to just... Whatever you ask, know that it's going to be given to you when we ask according to his will. Now, I'm very aware that this subject gets touchy with some people, okay? So bear with me. Because the teaching on miracles is as varied as the number of miracles Christ did in the Bible. There's beliefs all over the place. There are a group of people that don't believe the miracles are for now and that they, were, they ended at Acts 2. I'm not exactly sure how we explain everything else that's happened in the world since then, but cool. If that's where you're at, cool. Like, that, that's fine. I'm hoping, I'm hoping I change your mind today. Some believe that the power of miracles is at our beck and call and that if we're not seeing them, it's because our faith isn't strong enough. And we need to work on our faith so that when we speak, it happens, right? And there are some people, God bless them, believe that the miracle doesn't happen because the person receiving it doesn't believe that it could happen. 
Now, as is usual, when it comes to the Bible, the truth is somewhere in the middle, right? I have a feeling I know at least one person that's going to raise their hand when I ask this question, but I'm curious if anyone else is familiar with a man by the name of Smith Wigglesworth. I knew you were going to raise your hand. but I'm... So if you're not familiar with Smith Wigglesworth, I have studied Smith Wigglesworth for some time now because the stories that come out of this man are downright amazing. Smith was born in England. I'm pretty sure late 18, early 1900s, somewhere in there, industrial England, extremely poor. Very bad time to be a kid in England because you worked. And Smith's story starts in the factory at eight years old, where he was working, <laughs> hard labor as an eight-year-old child, right? Right? But there was a man in that factory who was older than Smith and who took Smith under his wing and taught him about God because Smith didn't get God at home. And he showed him the Bible and he told him what God could do and he told him about the things that Christ could do. And as Smith grew up, he wasn't given the opportunity to have everything that he could have and do all the things that he could do he was given the opportunity to just rely on God. And as Smith grew up, he started to see God do some things in his life. And he devoted himself to prayer. And when he learned how to read, to read the word. And he devoted himself to God. And one day, at a Bible gathering, Bible meeting, there's a bunch of people in there, and Smith's listening to some of the preachers talk about the miracles of God and the power of God and saving people. And Smith has been in this, this place now watching people get saved, right? And some people get healed and different things like that happen. And the preacher just calls out because Smith is kind of on the team now, you know, they're like, yeah, he's a good guy. He's, he knows the word and he's prayerful and stuff. And he just goes, Smith, you're going to heal people. Here we go. And Smith's like, what? Okay. Um, I only know what the Bible's told me about healing, so I guess I'm just going to pray, and we'll see what happens. And every single person in that room got healed that night. Every single one. And you know what happens when that kind of stuff happens and word gets out? People start showing up. And for the good majority of the rest of Smith Wigglesworth's life, he traveled the world doing healing ministry, and doing miracles the likes that we haven't seen since. And when I talk the likes we haven't seen since, I'm talking about praying for people with cancer and the cancer physically falling out of their body. Praying for people with malformed limbs and the limbs growing back normally. Praying for people who were on their deathbed or even dead and raising the dead. So... I thought it very fitting that if we were going to talk about miracles and how is it and why is it that we don't see as much as we should see or we think we should see, that we could just hear from the man himself. You can find his books everywhere. There's compilations of his life's work. He wrote newsletters. He's written some of his own autobiographies. Some of his children have written about him. And I I couldn't spend an entire sermon up here talking about all the things that he got to see while he was alive. But this is what he says. You ready? You want power? Don't take the wrong way. Don't take it as power because you speak in tongues. And if God has given you revelations along certain lines, don't take that for the power. Or if you have even laid hands on the sick and they have been healed... Don't take that for the power. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That alone is the power. Don't be deceived. 
there is a place to get where you know the Spirit is upon you. So you will be able to do the works which are wrought by this blessed Spirit of God in you. And the manifestation of his power shall be seen, and people will believe in the Lord. What will make men believe the divine promises of God? Beloved, let me say to you today, God wants you to be ministering spirits, and it means to be clothed with another power. And this divine power, you know when it's there, and you know when it goes forth. The baptism of Jesus must bring us to have a single eye to the glory of God. Everything else is wasted time and wasted energy. Beloved, we can reach it. It is a high mark, but we can get to it. You ask how? What wilt thou have me to do? That is the plan. It means a perfect surrender to the call of God and perfect obedience. Saying, now I, he, he wrote a lot in kind of old English style, you know, so it's, some of it's a little, he'd like these and thou's and all that kind of stuff. What wilt thou have me to do? Translated into current English is, what would you have me do, Lord? What do you want me to do? Or as Isaiah in the throne room of God said, here I am, Lord, send me. When you say, what would you have me do, Lord? This brings you into line with his will. Now things can happen. Now the blind can see, right? In John 9, verses one through three, it says, and he went along, as he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus was prayed up and did the will of his father. Can you imagine what would have happened had Jesus decided just once to do what he wanted to do? Just one time, someone wouldn't have got what they were supposed to get. Going back to the many teachings on healing and miracles and all that stuff, many people use this verse, and I've heard this preached, and I believe very incorrectly, to say that God made this man blind, that God set it up so that that guy would be blind, so that at the appointed time when Jesus showed up, his glory could be seen. What a jerk. Seriously. If we preach and we teach... And out of this word, we get the fact that our God is a loving God who leaves the 99 and goes after the one, who will never leave you and never forsake you, who isn't going to bring affliction and illness and all these things on you, but brings you out of those things, then how can anyone say that that man was blind because God set it up so that Jesus could show up and heal him? What happens sometimes is we read the Bible and some teaching that we heard some time ago sneaks in and influences what we think about a certain passage or a certain way. That's why when we read the Bible, we need to read it not alone, but with the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can divide rightly the word of truth, right? So if this is the word of truth and we believe on this, then we cannot have a God that has decided one day that you are going to be afflicted at birth and that sometime down the road in your life, he's going to send someone your way to heal you. I don't want to serve that God. That's, that's crazy. Why would he do that? 
since the fall of man, since Adam and Eve in the garden. So here's, so here's why. Why, does, why, why, does this, why was this man blind? Why did this all happen? Why, why did things happen in the world? There's a book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Here's why. We live in a fallen world. At the time of Adam and Eve, when they decided to go and do what God told them not to do, sin came into the world. What does sin do? All the things that you've seen. Sin set in motion horrible, terrible, awful things to happen on this earth. We could get really deep into some of those horrible, awful things, but we're not going to go there. But why are our genetics kind of funny? There's a reason for that. Why are people born with Down syndrome, with micro deletions, with weird limbs, outside of maternal influences, right? Because we live in a fallen world. Because it's not the way God made it. It's not the way he wanted it to be. But at the beginning, we made a choice. We got the world that we wanted. Unfortunately, now, I didn't want that world, but Adam and Eve decided that's what we want. And it's just a testament to how your decisions affect people all down the line, right? Don't think for a minute that God decided to make that man blind. The fallen state of the world decided that. But what God did do is he set that man aside for the exact moment in time to display his power through Jesus into that man so he would see again. You see, God decided when the time would be right for the healing, not a moment before, not a moment after, right? Jesus only had to obey his father and do what he was asked. In the same way, we only have to obey our father to see the miracles. Do you believe that God's timing is the best timing? That's hard. That's hard for some people, especially if you've been sitting with stuff for years. And you might be sitting there going, I want to believe God's timing is the best timing, but boy, I wish he'd hurry it up. Right? He has a plan. The Bible says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Can you trust in his plan? The next question is, where does your hope lie? Our minds are too small to understand his. That's the first understanding you gotta, you gotta get in your head. You are not gonna understand the mind of God. So stop trying. We need to expand our thinking beyond our understanding. And when you're sitting there like, well, how do I try to understand something I can't understand? It's in this. We need to know that God's plan is better than ours and that in his will, all things will be accomplished. That's the understanding that we need to have. This idea of miracles, signs and wonders, and things happening. See, you don't have the ability to do any of it. You have none of it. You weren't born with the ability to heal anybody. You don't have the ability to prophesy on your own. 
The Holy Spirit and God are the only things that manifest these things in your life. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's really hard to do miracles. If you're not in a relationship with Christ, chances are things aren't going to follow you. You're not going to see these things. But if you have relationship, if you have the Holy Spirit and you want to do the will of God, that's the key piece, remember? In his will, in his understanding, you will place yourself. And again, remember, this isn't you doing it because if you do the will of God and you're saying, what is it you want me to do? What should I do? How should I do it? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to talk to today? Point out someone to me, Lord, if you want something done. When it hits you and you see it, what would you have me do, Lord? What would you have me do? You want to see miracles? What would you have me do? That's your question. This is a challenge to me and to all of us. It literally has to do with how are you walking with God? How, how does your walk look? How does your life look? And this is the dichotomous crux of Christianity, right? Because what do we do? We fight, right? We fight ourselves all the time. I really want to do what God wants me to do, but I really want to do that thing instead. Yeah. Is that cool, God? He's going to go, yeah, yeah, of course. Do what you want to do. But what are you missing? What are you missing out on? What are you missing out on? It, this, this is hard, guys. Trust me. I, mean, I was sitting like, God, really? This is okay, okay, all right. Well, we'll talk about it. Jesus' walk on this planet when he was here was in perfect line with God. He didn't stray to the left or to the right. He spent copious amount of time, uh, time in prayer, fasting, and working his ministry. And this is where we get caught. Well, I'm not a minister. I don't work for a church. I have a job. I have a family. Like Jesus was single. He had his disciples. They traveled wherever they wanted to go, but he didn't travel wherever he wanted to go. He went where God told him to go. He did what God told him to do. So the question and the issue that you have to reconcile in your mind is this. Can I do what God wants me to do wherever I'm at? Can I hear the voice of the Lord in my job? Can I hear the voice of the Lord when I'm around my family? Can I hear the voice of the Lord when I'm in the grocery store? Can I hear the voice of the Lord when I'm driving down the road? Can I hear the voice of the Lord? Can I hear the... That's the question, right? What's the answer? Yes. Any of you ever been woken up in the middle of the night because God tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, I got something to tell you. You can hear the voice of the Lord in your sleep. You want to see miracles? You want to see God's power move? What is it you would have me do, Lord? The closer and closer and closer that you can get to that way of life where you're living your life constantly saying, what would you have me do, Lord? What would you have me do, Lord? And again, you don't have to be a, an evangelist. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to start a church. In our cultural context, Satan wants you to believe that, well, it's easier to be a pastor because they're expected to be that way. They're expected to live that way, right? We expect Brad Stanfest to be turned on to Jesus all the time. 
right? I've seen Brad at home. He doesn't preach at home, okay? <laughs> He's a man just like me, just like you. He has the things he likes to do, and he has the things that he doesn't like to do, and he has the struggles just the same as you and I do. But the excuse should not be, well, he's a pastor, so it's easier because it's expected. He's a Christian. You're a Christian. God gave him the same call that he's given you. Go and make disciples of all nations, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, doing more than what Jesus did when he was on the planet, right? You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to travel the world like Smith. That was Smith's calling. And he impacted the world in a massive way. And I would argue near millions of people were saved because he asked, what would you have me to do? And why is our focus not on the healing or the prophecy, or the tongues, but on the Holy Spirit, because it's not about you. It's not about what you can do. It's about what God can do through you. And when your constant focus is, what would you have me do, Lord? How would you have me to do it? What do you want me to say? Where do you want me to go? And God says, do this, and you go, yes, Lord, and you do it. It's not you doing it. You've removed yourself completely from the equation and you're saying, God, let's do this. Me and you, I'm your vessel, I'm your child. You want me to do it? Let's do it. You want the miracles to come? What would you have me do? I want you to go lay hands on that person you've never met before and don't know their name, but their name's Sarah, and I want you to put hands on her and say, God knows your back's been hurting for years, but he wants to heal you today. And what's that gonna do for Sarah? It's not just gonna heal her, she's gonna come to the Lord. That's what it's all about. It's not about what we get out of it. It's about what they get affected by. That's what Smith was saying in that. The spirit of the Lord is upon me and people will come to the Lord. The works and the healing and the miracles are but avenues to bring people to Jesus. That's all they are. And praise God when they happen. Praise God when we see amazing things happen. Praise God for what he's done in many of your lives, right? Praise God for that. But it wasn't necessarily for you. What? God didn't heal me because of me? Let's go back to the blind man. I didn't read the rest of the passage on purpose because did you know that for the, one of the very few times in the, in, the, in the Bible, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, when we're talking about Jesus, that we completely leave Jesus where he was and we follow the blind man for a while. Because what happens? He goes in front of the synagogue. Who healed you? I don't know. This guy was walking on the road. Well, we think he's, you know, we, we think he's bunk. He's got to be a devil or some kind. Well, I don't know how he could be a devil and heal me. They send him away and bring him back again. Okay, so, so you can be cleared. So your conscience is clear in, the, in God. Tell us who healed you. I don't know, that guy on the road. Well, who do you think he is? He's got to be a prophet. Well, we don't think he's a prophet. We think he's got a devil in him. Well, Y'all got to be dumb. That's practically what he says to the, to the Pharisees. Like, y'all got to be dumb. This is, look, I'm right in front of you. They called his parents. Is he blind from birth? Yeah, he was blind from birth. He's never been able to see. They got all the evidence they possibly could and still couldn't see Jesus right in front of them. That's why that's there. And that's what proves that that man was not made blind by God at the beginning of his life. He was blinded by the sin of the world. Jesus came, listened to God, was there at the right place at the right time where God wanted him to be. And when the blind man said, Jesus, he said, what, what do you want? I want to see. It's done. Because Jesus is in his, God's talking to Jesus and go, yep, heal that guy right there. That's it. Heal him. Because I set him up so that he would be a testimony. Do you hear that? A testimony to everybody else that comes in contact with him. So understand that. Your healing 
may not have been for you. It may have been because you're supposed to be a testimony of the power of God to everybody that comes in contact with, with you for the rest of your life. It's, it's hard sometimes, especially if you've been in pain for a long time, tormented for a long time. You're like, man, what about me, God? You may even have laid hands on someone and seen them get healed and still don't have your own, right? When we change our thinking, when we change the, the process in our minds and go, you know what, because this healing thing isn't about me. It's about what God can do through me and how he can affect people around me and how he can bring more people to him. That's the ultimate. That's the ultimate goal. Your healing is not the ultimate goal. Do you know that one day you will be healed? It may not be in this life, but one day you will be healed. How do you know that he won't use your illness to bring others to him? Does your faith rest in the assurance that at some point you will be healed, whether in this life or the next? Right? Do you believe that someday, whether now or then, and can you rest in that? Can you take that in and and hold it and go, God, your will, what would you have me do? Do your words encompass this understanding that others would hear the hope and the faith in your voice and desire the same thing? How many testimonies could we bring up here right now from people who have been in affliction but yet praise the Lord and not let it be their, de- their definition. They're not defined by their illness. They're not defined by their disease. They're not defined by their situation. But yet God is praised and people have come to the Lord because of that. There's testimonies in here. For, I guarantee it. We've all heard of it whether it's nurses, doctors, family members, people on the street, people that, it doesn't matter. The goal is Christ. The goal is bringing more people to Christ. We want to go to heaven and take as many people with us as we can. What avenue that you use to do that is up to God. If he wants to heal you, And by your healing, hundreds of people are going to be saved. He's going to do it. If you're going to have an illness, not from God, but given by this world, and he chooses not to heal you because hundreds of people are going to come to Christ through your testimony, that's the way it's going to go. Is your mind and your heart focused on that as the goal? Or are we still worried about how we feel and what's going on in us? It's it's hard. It's hard. God can use anything to draw people to him. How do you know that your affliction won't save people? You could be the blind man just waiting for your time, right? Right? And to you who desire to do the miracles, to those of you who are sitting here like, okay, all right, I get it. I I hear what he's saying. Are you asking, what would you have me to do? Are you poised to accept God's direction in order to see the works of the Lord manifest in your life and those around you? How is your relationship with Christ? Are you striving for that perfect gift? That is eternal life in Christ Jesus? So there we are in an ICU waiting room, waiting for what? I don't know. But what I did know is that God was with me. 
God was with my family and that in this life or the next, my dad would be healed. We got to the hospital Monday morning. About five minutes before they were taking him down for his ablation. I took this Bible and my whole family went in the room and we surrounded my dad and God had told me before we got to the hospital, he said, I want you to read out of Ezekiel and I want you to prophesy over your father and I want you to say dry bones live. And he said, I want you to say out loud breath of God, fill this body and prophesy that you will live and not die. Not only did my father come through his ablation without any complications, he was physically doing better than he was prior to being hospitalized. I don't know how many of you have had to spend any amount of time in the hospital, but that's not how it works. Especially when you're 81 years old and we're already in rehab. Six days in a hospital bed, the most activity getting up to a bedside commode, and Tuesday morning he got up with physical therapy and walked out in the hallway. And they said to him, my gosh, you're doing so well. You might only need a week of therapy and that's it. You can go home. How does that work? That's it. By the power of a holy God who decided that it wasn't his time yet. That he had more to do. That maybe this testimony right here might affect somebody in a way that brings them to the Lord. In the will of God, my father is doing well. And in the will of God, when it's his time, he will go. The only thing that we can do is line up with his will. Do what he tells us to do and then stand back and let him work. And watch in awe as he works his way to bring people to him. May God be praised for his perfect will and may we walk in his will always. I got a picture. That was Wednesday morning, the day we came home. And I want to tell you guys, we felt your prayers. We appreciate you guys. I can't tell you what it meant to my family to have you guys praying for us. And the hundreds of people... <laughs> that were praying for my father during this ordeal and for my family. Because not only did God work this miracle, but God brought my family closer together. There are relationships there that were not there before this happened. Closeness and understanding, things happened my my dad is remarried and you know that can be kind of funny sometimes with things. But there were things that happened there that brought some healing and understanding. So understand that when you guys were praying for my dad, when you guys were praying for me, you were, the whole lot more was going on. The Bible says the prayers of the righteous avail much, which means they are very effective. So you guys were doing a whole lot, and we thank you for that, and I appreciate you all. There's always more to come. 
If you're still here on this earth, God's not done with you yet. And it doesn't matter if you're eight or 80. God, what is it you would have me do? Father God, we thank you so much. We thank you so much, Lord. And Lord, I pray that we would start asking you the question, what is it you would have me do? And then stand back and let you do your work, Lord. Lord, we thank you for life. We thank you for new life and we thank you for old life. And God, we thank you for your words that in times of difficulty, in times of sorrow, in times of pain, Lord, can bring supernatural comfort, supernatural peace, and supernatural understanding to us, Lord, so that we can walk in your ways and walk in your will and be able to truly look up into the heavens and say, your will be done. May your will be done, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for bearing with me, guys. Appreciate y'all. You are dismissed if you still need prayer. That worship in the middle was pretty...